everyone, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Savannah Lawson, and I'm an education specialist at Rookery Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. This week, our theme for programming is stewardship, also known as our resource or land management department. Part of what the stewardship team does is oversee our cultural resources, also known as archaeological sites that are found here within the reserve. Humans have lived within what is now Rookery Bay Research Reserve for thousands of years, but this presentation is going to focus on the pioneer history that took place within the reserve, specifically between 1884 and 1905 and the northern end of Rookery Bay and what was called the Little Marco Settlement. This presentation was created by Steve Bertoni, who has worked for more than 20 years in our stewardship department to document, monitor, and maintain archaeological sites throughout the reserve. So a big thanks to him for putting this together for us. This is a map of Rookery Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. For those of you who have not visited, or maybe even for those of you who have, we are actually 110,000 acres uh, of both preserved terrestrial and aquatic areas. The yellow line that you can see on the screen maps the boundaries of the reserve. So as you can see, we extend from just south of downtown Naples and Gordons Pass on that northern end of Kiwaden Island, and we actually extend all the way down to the southeast where we border with Everglades National Park. So again, we are mostly mangrove islands in aquatic areas, and that's gonna play an important role as we learn more about the people who lived here because the layout of the reserve played a huge role in the way people lived there. Of course, being mostly aquatic, early settlers were hugely dependent on boats for trade, transportation, and just every basic of life. So before we dive back into history, a little bit more about Rookery Bay, uh, we are part of what is called the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. And specifically, as part of DEP, we fall under what is called the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection. So through the RCP office, we actually protect 4 million acres across the state. Again, mostly aquatic areas that this office in particular is overseeing. So all of our aquatic preserves, all of the National Estuarine Research Reserves, of which we are one, and I will talk a little bit more about those in just a minute, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and the Coral Reef Conservation Program all fall under this office. So as I mentioned, we are part of what is called this National Estuarine Research Reserve System. So a little policy lesson for everyone. Back in 1972, Congress passed what is called the Coastal Zone Management Act. And this gave guidance to coastal states on how to manage their coastal resources. And as part of the Coastal Zone Management Act, the government asked states to look at estuaries that were relatively pristine and undeveloped that could be set aside for both research and education. At this time, scientists didn't know much about how estuaries worked and why exactly they were important, although we knew they were. So this helped us set aside those areas again so that we could research them, learn about them, and then disseminate that information to students, to families, to the public, and to other scientists as well. So there are 29 of these reserves currently in the country. One is proposed in Connecticut, which will hopefully become our 30th, and there has been talk of a few others being created as well. Here in Florida, there are three of these NERS, as we like to call them. Rookery Bay, of course, down here in Naples, and then there's also Apalachicola National Estuarine Research Reserve on the Panhandle, and Guana Tolomato Matanzas National Estuarine Research Reserve up in St. Augustine. So I would highly recommend any of these reserves if you ever have the chance to get to another one. So again, before we begin a little bit more about what an estuary actually is and why this is going to be important to this presentation. So estuaries, very simply put, are these coastal areas where you have salt and fresh water meeting and mixing. There's kind of, uh, estuaries all around the world, but they're all going to look different depending on where they're located. Most estuaries are formed by a river or large freshwater body dumping out directly into the ocean. Here in Florida and South Florida, we're a little bit unique in that most of our freshwater is coming from rain that's running off through the Everglades and the Big Cypress Swamp and then coming out and meeting the Gulf of Mexico. So these estuaries are incredibly productive areas meaning that they're really great places for life to live in and reproduce and create more life. So fish, shellfish, birds, mammals, 
pretty much any species you can think of that lives in South Florida is going to use the estuary in one way or another at some point in its life. Looking at this map, you can see the different pioneer settlements that are all marked here with these dots. That CR stands for cultural resource, which again is another term for an archeological site within the reserve. And in this case, specifically sites from that pioneer era. So there were quite a few different settlements throughout the Northern end of Rookery Bay Research Reserve um, from the late 1800s and into the 1900s. This is the original survey of Henderson Creek that was done in 1876 by a man named William S. Henderson. He was a U.S. Army surveyor who camped along the creek um, and actually used this survey, um, or the government did, to help award land to early settlers. The first homestead grant was given to Obadiah Hall in 1884 along Henderson Creek at what is now Shell Island Road. Comparing this survey to a current satellite image of Henderson Creek, you can see that there were discrepancies in this map. And as we'll learn later on in this presentation, uh, some of these discrepancies led to arguments between land owner, owners about who actually owned what. This shows several of those families who moved here between 1885 and 1903. You can see that in some cases you had multiple members of the same family, all starting different homesteads, such as the Stevens and Williams, and then other families moving down here individually. This photograph is of the Whidden family, uh, circa 1900. The Whiddens lived along Upper Henderson Creek from 1886 to 1927, so for a total of 41 years. And if you look front and center, um, you can see that not only did they have eight children, but they had a pet deer as well. And this is not the only evidence that we have seen of these pioneer settlers having pet deer in their homes. Back in the early 1900s, a gentleman by the name of Julian Dimmick, uh, a very well-known photographer from New York, made his way down to South Florida. He is best known for photographing the Seminole Indians out in the Everglades, but in addition to that photography work, he also came to uh, the area that is now Henderson Creek in, within Rookery Bay Research Reserve and photographed some of the early pioneer settlements there with this beautiful black and white photography. So this structure here is actually the home of William Bill Kirkland. And this is located right on Henderson Creek behind what is now our learning center um, on now what is our snail trail. So very close to home, this one, if you will. And this is Bill Kirkland himself. So Bill lived again along Henderson Creek with his wife, Almady Goodman, and his son, Harvey. And his homestead was right next door to his half-brother, Reese Kirkland, who moved down and started to homestead just a few years before Bill did. Both of the, these Kirkland brothers were avid hunters. And this is a photograph of a hunting party with the Kirklands, Carols, and Julian Dimmick. Uh, in 1905, leaving the Henderson Creek area and traveling towards Big Cypress. So hunting and trapping was a mainstay for the Kirkland brothers, and they were often hired as guides for the clientele of the Naples Beach Club. Now, farming was incredibly important to these pioneers when they moved down here, and one of their main crops was actually sugarcane. So in this picture, what you're seeing is uh, Reese Kirkland, again, right at what is now our snail trail, uh, grinding down this sugar cane. So Reese Kirkland arrived here by ox cart in 19, or 1891, six years before Bill Kirkland did. And this photograph is of Bill Kirkland taking that sugar cane that's been ground down and actually boiling it in this big vat. So this vat structure is actually made of limestone, which was one of the only materials, building materials that they really had down here at this time. And this is something that may be familiar to a few of you who have visited us before, but if you are to go out on that snail trail, you're gonna walk right by this cistern. So cisterns were used for water storage at many of these homestead sites, and there are a lot of them that still remain throughout the reserve. 
So they were made from what is called tabby, which was crushed, pulverized, or burned limestone shell that was then mixed with sand and water to form this sort of primitive cement. So this is the one that would have been at the Kirkland homestead. Now, life wasn't only challenging for the adults who were farming, but it was challenging for students and teachers as well. And there were two early schools that were located uh, within what is now Rookery Bay Research Reserve. So the first one would have been the Henderson Creek School, which was along Henderson Creek, but known at the time as Little Marco School. And that was established in 1894, so not very long after those first pioneers showed up. The second school was known as the Bell Mead School, which was further up Henderson Creek and was established in 1906. Unfortunately, that school burned down in 1943, and years before that, the Little Marco School had ended up closing in 1928. There is still some evidence of the schools, however. This is a artifact from Shell Island Road, a piece of a desk from the Columbus School Desk Company, which is actually based in Chicago. So excerpts from the diary of Frank Watts Hall, who was a school teacher from Alva, Florida. Tell us a little bit more about what life was actually like for a school teacher out there. He wrote in his diary on October 17, 1898, my first day as a teacher had eight pupils, all our bright children, had to keep a smoke in the schoolhouse all day to drive out the mosquitoes and sand flies. It rained in the afternoon and made the walk to the boat very unpleasant. I rode nearly all the way home. So as you can see, it was a very, very different way of life back then for both students, teachers, and everyone that was living down here in these homesteads. Here you can see the number of children uh, in different grades between 1928 and 1942. So many more students in those younger grades. And then inevitably, as they got older and were a bit more capable of helping their parents out on the homesteads, you saw a pretty large reduction in the number of students that were enrolled in the schools there. And there were, as I mentioned, many hardships. Uh, a few examples, a man named Joseph B. Williams, his home burned down on Little Marco uh, in 1887, and this was only two years after building it. And you can imagine how difficult it would have been, not just to acquire the materials to build a home, but to actually get them out to this island and construct a house at this time period. Um, then just four years later, his wife and two of his four children actually left because it was just too difficult of a uh, lifestyle there. Another example, a man by the name of Robert Demerit uh, settled in Upper Henderson Creek in 1886. Not even a decade later, in 1893, his wife and two daughters all died from tuberculosis. So this was not an easy place to live or an easy time uh, in these folks' lives. And some more remnants of pioneer life that shows some of those difficulties. This is a pretty common find within these archaeological sites or cultural resources. This is an old medicine bottle. So hygiene and medicine were not nearly as advanced then as they are now, especially with how limited the resources were at the time. So again, something you can commonly find is these medicine bottles that folks were using to try to stay healthy. And of course, there was murder as well. Um, this is one story about a gentleman named Willoughby A. Stevens, who was killed by circulating a petition. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, uh, that 1876 Henderson Creek survey was not entirely accurate. So there was uh, a man in 1892 named Mr. Edmund Scott, who was a surveyor with Lee County, and he began a petition to have a new survey completed, one that was controversial with certain landowners because of the way it would have changed their deeds. So Mr. Willoughby Stevens was killed while circulating that petition by a man named J.B. Williams, who ended up fleeing to the Everglades following the murder. On this old map here, you can see the locations where both of these men lived, both uh, J.B. Williams, the murderer, and his home on Little Marco Island, and then a bit further south, the home of Willoughby A. Stevens. What's interesting about this map is looking at the size of Key Waden Island. For those of you who have been there, you will realize that it is much larger now. Being a barrier island, it has been growing for the for over a hundred years now, 
Um, and it has actually grown substantially since this map would have been created um, over 100 years ago. So pretty interesting geologic tidbit there. And this is the actual site of the J.B. Williams homestead on Little Marco Island. It's thought to be the last standing historic structure located within the boundaries of Rookery Bay Research Reserve. So very important site. One thing you can notice is this Sansevieria or snake plant, also known as mother-in-law's tongue, that's growing in the foreground. That is a very, very common plant to find growing around pioneer settlements. It was something that was brought here very commonly as an exotic house plant and now has spread along a lot of these historic sites. This is also from the J.D. Williams homestead. These pine logs are thought to have been used for the barn there and a pair of double wide barn doors supports this theory as well. And this photograph is of Forrest Walker driving on Old County Road 22, which was a primitive and unreliable shell road that was often underwater at this time. Um, later on in 1927, a rail line was established to Marco Island on what is now Collier Boulevard. So pioneer families started moving from outer islands and into these growing towns. Um, and really from 1927 on after that rail line was built, it effectively ended the pioneer era in this area and things really started to change here in Southwest Florida. Now today, as I said, we monitor many of these sites that tell us about what life was like here for these pioneer families. And this here is a cemetery for the Kirkland family that's located on Shell Island Road. So several early pioneering members of the Kirkland family are buried here um, and ground penetrating radar has actually revealed 12 unmarked graves in and around this cemetery as well. So we actually believe that this was probably used prior to the Kirkland family arriving. And to end on a lighter note, this is the headstone of one member of the Kirkland family, Chester Kirkland, who arrived at Henderson Creek by ox cart in 1891. So he was interviewed in 1980, two years before he died, and told many funny stories of rowing to the Naples Hotel for the night, where he would play fiddle long into the evening and dance with the many women there and his fellow pioneering men who would have rowed there and back with him the next day. So while this era is over, we are fortunate to have our stewardship team to monitor and care for these relics of American history and make sure that they are accessible to folks throughout the country, the county, and the state as well. Thank you all for tuning in. Please check out our worksheet that's going to quiz you on a little bit of the information that you learned in this video. And please tune back in for more programming from Rookery Bay Research Reserve to come soon.